how's everyone doing today? Starting a little bit early. I'm looking forward to this conversation. My name is Dr. Sarah Renee Langley, and we are here to talk about how to over overcome during and after the pandemic. And I wanted to go ahead and get things started. How are you today? How are you? I'm going to make sure that I can see you. So you see me looking up is because I'm also making sure that I check you in different, <laughs> different angles here on the different platforms that we are live streaming. And I'm just excited about this conversation because today, and you have to let me know how is it going for you in regards to the different types of webinars that we had since we started last week. And we talked about overcoming anxiety. We talked about grief and loss. We talked about taking charge of your mental health. How has that been for you? Were you able to apply the tips and the tools and the strategies that you have been provided? Have you been showing up? Because see, 80% is just showing up. And that right there is your way to success. And the whole point of why we are doing these free webinars for you is to help you to become mentally whole, mentally stable, mentally healthy, and holistically whole. And is a better way, what better way to do that than now during this pandemic so that we can be prepared for post pandemic. So again, my name is Dr. Sarah Renee Langley. My business is called Lead Her International where I help individuals like yourself to learn your ABCs, how to achieve, how to become, and how to conquer in your goals and in your life. And I am so looking forward to, we have our guest speaker, Dr. Monique Gary. And I'm going to read her bio. So that's why I have to make sure that I have all the different, you know, everything located where, where it needs to be. I'm going to go ahead and start live streaming. And I am so excited about this conversation because this is a long overdue conversation, actually. Um, although I do believe, I'm a firm believer that everything happens when it's supposed to happen. Everything happens for a reason. And because of the fact that everything happens for a reason, it was right on time. This is timely. Very much time on top of a conversation because what we're going to talk about today, what we're going to talk about today is having a candid conversation with this medical doctor about real talk, real talk about COVID-19, the pandemic, and beyond. So let me go ahead and bring her into the conversation. And as always, we're just gonna keep the show rolling. I'll keep it going. And please, if you're able to see me, please put in the comment section that you're able to see me. As we're going to work out all the technical difficulties, if we're gonna even call it technical difficulties, because I'm, I'm also one who is about making sure that what we say, we get what we say. And I wanna make sure that I speak the right words to have exactly what I'm looking for. Let her know that we are starting. Let me see if I can bring her on. And so what we're doing today is really having a candid conversation because what was going on for me and seeing your posts, seeing what people have been saying, see, seeing what people have been talking about in regards to how the pandemic has impacted you emotionally, financially, physically, emotionally. And this is exactly why we're having this conversation because we, were, we would see so much going on in the hospitals. We would see and hear from our own fellow friends and family members talking about the devastation, and that's just an understatement of what people were going through, being in the hospital, how it was forecast and reflected on the media or in the media compared to what we were seeing right then. And so this is exactly why we want to have this conversation with Dr. Monique Gary, because of the fact that it is a matter of getting the perspective from someone who is a frontliner, who is one who have fellow colleagues who are frontliners, who's on the front lines, helping us with their selfless act of service on what is really going on. And 
if you have any questions, any comments that you want to share, feel free to put it in the comment section as well so that we can all have a candid conversation just to get clarity, to get insight, help to quell the uncertainties, to help quell and help to reduce the anxiety and the fear and the frustration. Let's now just have dialogue and conversation, you know, from this perspective so that we can all now learn how to overcome during and after the pandemic. So I want to bring in Dr. Monique Gary. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm well. I need you to activate my camera. It won't allow me to start my video. It says... I, yeah, um, probably you probably have to give it a minute or so. Everything is activated, so we just don't have to... worry. Yeah. But you look beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And guess what? You're live. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I love live. You know why? Because <laughs> it, it, it's very candid. Like you can't, you can't edit it. You can't go back. You can only say what's truly in your heart and your mind. And, and that's what we should be doing anyway right now, right? Exactly. And that's exactly why you are here, doctor, because of the fact that it was a matter of just having a candid conversation, an open one. I was just sharing with the audience, uh, for those who are tuning in, my name is Dr. Sarah Langley, and we are here talking about this whole mental health, May is Mental Health Month, and it's all about overcoming during and after the pandemic. And I definitely wanted to connect with Dr. Monique Gary because she's a trusted colleague. She's someone who, you know, you see her face, you hear her name, and you know that you're gonna get real and get real answers or get real conversations because what happens is that we can get uncertain, we can get confused, we can get fearful and because of the fact that we have those question marks that's going on and we don't know who to trust, we don't know what source to pull from, we don't know what we don't know. And that's why it's a matter of now being able to connect with someone from who is a frontliner, who have colleagues who are frontliners and getting it from a, medical doctor's perspective on real talk about this pan pandemic, real talk about COVID-19, and also inviting you in the conversation so that, again, we can at least try to you know, provide insight and awareness so that you can make some conscious decisions on which way to go concerning your life, your livelihood, your lifestyle, and your family's lifestyle as well. This so, Dr. Incredible. Mona, thank you so much for your time. Now, just a little housekeeping for me. Is this live on your Facebook also, or is this only live to the group of people who've pre-registered? It's only to live for the people who are pre-registered. Okay. But we share it out, it can also get to you so that you can share it out to your individuals. I would absolutely love to do that. I think that folks were looking on my page to see if something was going to be uh, broadcast live through Facebook or one of the other uh, media. Okay. Um, I'm still waiting for the camera here. And it is ready. I am ready. But this is, it's really something, you know, like a once in a generation, hopefully, kind of thing. I mean, if you think about it, even our grandparents did not necessarily experience the, the pandemic yes. of, uh, of 1918. My grandmother was born in 1927, uh, and she passed away at 86. So, you know, you figure like this is something that we hopefully, hopefully, prayerfully will never see again in our lifetimes and nor will our children and hopefully not our children's children. Uh, but, but here we all are in the middle of this very uh, universal experience, but everybody's not experiencing it the same way. And so I love the fact that you are giving these perspectives from all walks of life, you know, because even though we're all in it, people who have means have a very different quarantine experience than those of us who don't folks who are first liners and who are essential workers, you know, and have to go out to their jobs are having a very different experience than the people who are staying at home and have to teach their kids and homeschool in ways that they never imagined. And so is, there's so many facets to it. And it, it really is going to provide a, a lot of data for many years to come on, on how we all survived this and, and what we all did with this, you know? Exactly, exactly. And, you know, what's interesting is the fact that like you said, this is, it, we're hopeful. It, it's, it's about having hope that we learn what we are learning now so that we can be better after this. And at the same time, it is about having honest conversations and, and just knowing what to do because many of us are, or many, 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 many people are at a loss. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know what to believe. And the fact that no one has seen this coming and the fact that 
we just don't know what we're heading to toward after mm -hmm. everything starts to open up after we are to go back home or so go go to work and 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 you know jump start the economy again and you know it's just so much at this and i cannot wait just to start at least the start of really unpacking or pulling some layers from uh, from your perspective doctor because mm -hmm. of the fact that what what really had me and prompted me to reach out to you and to talk with you is because i have plenty of friends who are nurses who are doctors and I am counseling doctors and clinicians mm -hmm. um, and, and nurses in regards to how from being a, as a frontliner, how this has impacted them. And many of them have said that, you know, in my 30 plus years and my 40 plus years, I've never experienced or seen anything like this. Some of them are thinking about <laughs> reconsidering their, their careers. They're reconsidering a lot of things. They had to change their lifestyle. They, yeah. Some of them can't go home. They decided to take up residency at a hotel because they were concerned about bringing it home to their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like, it, it impacted them in so many levels. And that's just, I'm just talking about the doctors, the nurses, the frontliners who are in the hospitals. And we see the media and we just don't know what to believe, you know? And then we don't hear much of anything going on anymore. You yeah. know, it's like we're kind of at a loss. And I just really wanted to bring you to this conversation because being who you are and the position that you hold and carry, that perhaps, please, it would be awesome just to have a kind of conversation with you, just to see or to find out from your perspective, like what in the world is mm -hmm. going on? What is your perspective and how it's being handled you know, at this time with the pandemic, with COVID-19. I just really want to start it there. Okay. Um, it, it's so multifaceted, you know, and um, still uh, waiting for Zoom. I think the, to start the camera, the Zoom moderator might have to, to, to do that one. And um, it, I say multifaceted because, you know, let me set the stage for you with respect to how... Um, how we're trained. So nurses and physicians are certainly trained differently and physicians are trained to, um, to endure the worst of whatever the task is in order to um, plan and prepare and, and optimize for the best outcome. And so I'm a general surgeon, which means that uh, after college, I uh, went to graduate school and then I went to medical school for four years. And then I did a five-year residency and a one-year fellowship. And so when I go to career day and talk to kids, I tell them, you know, when I was in training, I told them I was in the 32nd grade. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, 17 years later, after high school, you finally have, you know, worked 100 hours a week, et cetera, uh, in order to learn your craft, in order to um, do the best that you can for patients. And that often comes at a cost of, uh, of rest, of mental wellness, of uh, depression, of isolation, lots of different things, because you don't necessarily have control over where you get to do most of that training. It's very um, arbitrary, lottery-based, luck-based, lots of different things influence where doctors train. But once you finally are in your practice, you then begin to use what you know to try to make things better. And so all of a sudden comes this this situation and you know we didn't get a lot of uh, information on the the news back in january no one really knew very much in february uh no one knew a whole lot but we began on some of our uh our social media networks to hear from from friends and colleagues from doctors overseas who say hey listen we're starting to see something here and this is what we're seeing and people are getting really sick etc and all of a sudden you know now we're friends from seattle are saying listen we're getting hammered over here are you guys seeing this in new york are you seeing this in florida are you seeing it in dc and it was very um interesting to track how the virus spread throughout uh, just our colleagues and how immediately overwhelmed they, they were because there just weren't enough resources in the health system to accommodate for how sick people were all of a sudden. Right. And, you know, I think we're starting to see now that plateauing of the curve, uh, but it was completely overwhelming for the health system and for the physicians who, you know, were used to a certain level of volume. But what do you do now when you don't have resources? You know, we didn't have an Ebola crisis here in the United States, but in, in countries that did, they've seen this before. You know, they've seen it in the, in the uh, 2000s. They saw it again, you know, in the 70s. And so understanding that, you know, there are times when illness may overwhelm the, the health system was something that we were not prepared for. 
in the midst of all things we were prepared for. We were prepared to have enough beds, to have enough ventilators, to have enough resources to treat the people we were seeing. And so as, as folks began to pile in and as folks began to, uh, to die from this, uh, from this disease that no one, there we are, from this disease that no one had anticipated, uh, it was really quite shocking to, to everyone. Uh, and that coupled with, I think, the response from uh, federal government regarding what was happening, was it truly happening, was it not happening? And, you know, with respect to what we were seeing and the lack of resources, uh, it was uh, completely overwhelming. I, have, I give an example, a good friend of mine uh, in the uh, Albany, Georgia area was sleeping in his garage mm -hmm. and uh, he's getting bit by ants every night because he was afraid to go into his home and to bring you know, the virus into the home because we still at that point weren't telling people to wear masks. We still, you know, did, we weren't social distancing, we weren't doing any of the things. And so you've got to imagine that if you have many people that you cannot help, it's like a, a, a war zone of sorts where um, there's just overwhelming um, fear. There's yes. overwhelming despair. There's overwhelming need. And for people who are trained to meet those needs and to be those heroes, it is completely, um, it's debilitating you know, to not be able to, to do those things. Uh, and so I think, you, you know, we saw that take a toll on healthcare providers and, you know, coupled with breathing in your own CO2 and wearing two masks and not having enough masks and not having proper protective equipment. Um, there really was a lot of uh, frustration and fear leading to anger on the part of healthcare providers. And, you know, now that the, the pendulum is beginning to swing the other way, it's really interesting because with so much misinformation and there's so many concerns conspiracy theories that go around and it's almost a slap in the face to doctors and nurses everywhere who are doing this work day in and day out because we will always look for the conspiracy we always look for you know and it's a, it's a human nature kind of thing because of the cognitive dissonance i think that yeah. we don't want to be stuck in our homes and you know we've got to reframe how we're thinking about being stuck or trapped or people have used imprisoned and all these horrible words that don't really apply to what this is um but that uh, that desire to escape and to have freedom of choice and freedom of right. movement um, is so strong that we're going to look for whatever supports that belief rather than believe what's true. And I think we're starting to see more and more of that. And that's a second wave of frustration for, for healthcare providers, you know, all across the country, because we know that we're in a very uh, precarious place where we need to continue to flatten this curve. And what that means is that the curve doesn't just spike and go down, it now plateaus, which means that there's a longer period of time where we all have to kind of sit in place and shelter in place. And that's what this time is for. It doesn't mean that, okay, great, the numbers are going down, everybody go back out because you know what's gonna happen? The plateau is going to do this. And so, you know, I'm waiting to see if the other shoe is gonna drop in a few weeks because a couple of weekends ago, we had some great weather, Mother's Day, people have been gathering. And, you know, it's gonna be something to, to see and to brace ourselves and prepare ourselves for. So, um, yeah, did I answer your question? <laughs> of what we're all feeling, you know? You know, yeah. you hit on so many things. And you look amazing, by the way. Oh, you thank know. you. Thank I, you. I mean, you look amazing. So I'm glad to, you know, finally get to see your beautiful face. And again, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Gary, and what you're sharing. Um, as a matter of fact, I want to do due diligence to you and want to thank everyone for tuning in. This is Dr. Sarah Langley, and we are doing our mental health in May series is called Overcoming During and After the Pandemic. And Dr. Monique Gary has been gracious enough with her time to give to us so that we can have a kind of conversation. A lot of what she just said is really hitting it for not just those who are on the front lines, but also us indirectly, as well as directly, because we're feeling similar the way that they are feeling. But to the point that, like she said, the thing that, so many things that Dr. Gary had, had said that, that hit me, and it has been heartbreaking, to say the least, with the fact that the frontliners are working so hard. I mean, and that's an understatement. To now have us as a country to now decide, okay, you know, we're deciding. At times, there have been times that we're not even listening to the powers that be who are medical professionals on what we need to do. And then you have individuals who are like, you know what, forget this, this is a hoax, this is a conspiracy theory, this is against our rights, I'm going out anyway, to turn around to now add to the numbers of people that are going to the hospital because, hey, they didn't follow the rules and the guidelines. So 
it's just a matter of us now talking and having the conversation because it has to start somewhere and why not have a conversation especially with someone who is in that type of field and, and to help bring some insight and some clarity to help us to make some conscious decisions about our own health holistically mind body and spirit and i want to do dr gary her due diligence um you know i want to serve her due diligence i have your bio up so i definitely want to introduce you properly <laughs> and properly I, had, I, I tried to put my glasses on, doctor. Um, <laughs> I'm about that age now. I need some glasses to listen. I have mine sitting right here. And the only reason I didn't put it on is because one thing I've learned through all of this, um, this, this, this pandemic and sheltering in place, we're doing tel telemedicine consults. I've done right. webinars and things. The glare from the ring. Exactly. You know, and I, I didn't know what a ring light was before all of this. So I, pray God. I have that right here with me, too. It's like you have your mm -hmm. whole studio set up now. Didn't even it's know. True. Yeah, I think we can. We should never and can never hate on millennials and zennials ever again because if we're not with the technological advances that have been made in this realm, none of us would be working at home. Exactly. Students would not be able to go to school. So thank you. I will never say a bad word about a millennial or a zennial again because all of this right here, this technology. Yeah, we would not have done this on our own. We would not have mastered this. No, not at all. And now our lives will be forever changed because of them. Thank you, millennials and Z. Whatever I don't even know wait, where we are now. Z, the Z generation. Zennials. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and 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 whomever after that. But yeah, thank you. Colonials. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, y'all. We just had to get that out. But here we go. Dr. Monique Gary is a board certified, fellowship trained breast surgical oncologist and medical director of the Grand View Health Pen Cancer Network cancer program in Sellersville, PA. Okay, where she also serves as director and of the press of the breast program. At this time, she is the only black breast cancer surgeon in the state of PA, Pennsylvania. Dr. Gary is a native from Philadelphia. As a matter of fact, she's a native from North Philly. Woo <laughs> Having completed her medical degree at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, PCOM, and for general surgery training at the University of Massachusetts Berkshire campus, as well as the Breast Surgical Oncology Fellowship at Georgetown University. As a physician, advocate, and expert on cancer and healthcare disparities, she is passionate about developing holistic and innovative approaches to cancer treatment, prevention, and general wellness, both in our region and throughout the world. Dr. Gary serves on the board of several national community organizations and serves on the board of directors for the American Society of Breast Surgeons. Dr. Gary was recognized as the leading physician of the world and top breast surgeon in Pennsylvania for all three years, 2017, 2018, and 2019, and is a fellow at the American College of Surgeons, the highest distinction awarded to surgeons and in the nation. She currently co-hosts a weekly health series called The Doctor Is In on blackdoctor.org, airing on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please, let's welcome Dr. Monique Gary. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's good to see you. It's good to see your face. It's great to see and you it's as well. It's good, to, it's good to be seen, so thank you for having me. So yes, thank you so much for your time. And just to get right in it a little bit further, let's talk about, um, as you mentioned, we, we have noticed how, because we have family members, we have friends who are frontliners, who are on the front lines and having to deal with everything that's going on. Um, I wanted to ask you your perspective in regards to how this has been managed and handled um, as, I guess, as a, as a country, mm. um, the difference in opinions, it's, seems like between the health care directors who are uh, the representatives who are supposed to advise our, our, our country's top leaders and it's seemingly that they're at odds and it has us all kind of like what the heck like uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know yeah. it, it, it really is um what's happened with this pandemic is reflective of what's happened with the administration, which is that when you, uh, when you deal with what is true, when you deal with the truth rather than try to write your own narrative, 
you find that you are better equipped to manage whatever comes your way. And so your story doesn't change over and over again. And it's been so interesting to see how the story has shifted uh, from an administrative and a, you know federal sort of standpoint regarding what was going on. I think we were never quite told. And, and we, meaning healthcare providers as well, because folks seem to think there's some grand conspiracy, like we understand everything that's going on when we are trying to stem the tide of what's happening. You know, the, the job of finding out what's going on and doing the epidemiologic work to understand what happened, how did it happen, how did it transmit, who was affected, all of those things are things that can happen at a sort of larger level than the frontline boots on the ground level because we're the people who are managing the ventilators and who are dealing with the different manifestations of this, which keep changing. And so people feel like they're not getting the whole story, but it's not because you're not getting it from healthcare. It's because one, the the story of the virus does seem to be changing. And two, because the the at the federal level where truth should come from, there was an awful lot of, I think, denial about really what was happening and um, um, you know, a lot of wishful thinking and a lot of uh, bravado about what the preparations had been. And, and we found out that, you know, the emperor really probably had no clothes on, uh, at least not enough. And I say that, you know, with all, all due respect, but what we can see from countries that have dealt in science and truth and that do believe in science um, are that they've been able to successfully stem the tide of, of this virus. Uh, and so there's, there's examples of that, you know, all across the country, uh, excuse me, across the world. And um, I think that we should probably look to those. And what that means for the person who's listening, the average person, is that you might look to get your news from more than just your local source but more than just your national source. So Associated Press, Public Radio, like there's some good places that you can go to get news that's happening, not just in the United States. And so part of our job as citizens, as global citizens, is to be better informed because what we're doing is we go to social media one and we take our news from there and it's a cesspool of misinformation because as soon as somebody clicks send and sends it out into the ether, it goes to everybody's. I don't know if you've seen, it goes to every single person's Facebook and next thing you know, there's misinformation that's propagated everywhere. So certainly not getting information from social media, but two, looking at beyond you know the, 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 the local and national borders to get what's true if you feel like you're not getting the truth from uh, those who control the media. And that's a real problem, you know? So I think there's that thing. But then also when you look at what healthcare providers are saying there are, there's a little bit of dissonance in what I call respectability politics, where it's a great opportunity to start to single out what's happening in one community versus another without understanding the, the social determinants of health. And I'll give you a great example. The Surgeon General made some comments, do it for your, for your, you know, for your, your abuela, do it for your mama and your pop pop and how black folks need to, you know, look at uh, what we eat and drink and stop, you know, uh, smoking and exercise and all these things that the community does need to focus on without understanding that there are social determinants to health that um, are, are inflating the numbers of African Americans who are uh, affected and, and, and our mortality is higher because of it. I mean, you could go into, you know, vitamin D deficiency. And we're finding that vitamin D now is a real um, uh, factor in boosting the immunity and that people who are vitamin D deficient are tending to do poorly. Well, who's vitamin D deficient, right? And if you want to get even deeper, the vitamin D test, the blood test was never designed for us. And so initially the blood test that we were using showed we were all deficient because we didn't have the protein that the test was testing for, right? It has nothing to do with hypertension. It has nothing to do with alcoholism in our communities. You know, why aren't we talking about things that really matter versus trying to point out different social groups and different racial and ethnic groups. And, and that's, that's where my, um, you know, that, 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 that gets my, it gets my goat really when you talk about how we're dealing with this, because we could deal with the real and if we're going to deal with the real, then we need to deal with the real and, and not deal with this, the respectability politics of what's going on and try to blame black people for what's happening here. Cause that's, that's not going to fly, you know? You know, and that's excellent. You just said some things that I didn't even, I didn't know. And the fact that the conversation can go such, such, such more deeply into root, right? The root cause, the root problem. But we tend to, we general, we tend to only go based on the surface. And that's where we stop short, right? The fact that we're now at odds, we don't know where to go get our, our real information from. We conclude and you know decide, because again, from a psychological standpoint, when we have question marks in our minds, we have to answer them, even if it's wrong, even if the answer is wrong. Well, the gaps, exactly right. 
So because of that fact, now here we are, all many people are still at a place of uncertainty, fear, at a loss. They just do not know what to do. And I love what you said in regards to becoming more informed. You know, instead of stopping short at social media, because it's convenient, it's easy, it's accessible, it's drama, because unfortunately, you know, as people, and I'm not, I'm just, I'm just saying people generally, we tend to gravitate towards what is drama, you know, what's dramatic, as opposed to really, if we're really interested in about getting the truth, yeah. and then being able to apply that truth to our own livelihood, our lifestyle, our, our well-being, our mental well-being, because at the end of the day, it really does stem to with our mental capacity. How are we thinking about a situation? And if we can make sure that we have this in control, then everything else will start to follow suit and align accordingly. I love so, that you said that, yeah. But yeah. if our government would do it, it'd be easier for people to do, you know, rather than for folks at the top to stick their head in the sand and say, oh, it's not really happening when it's actively infecting people in, you know, in those circles, you know, that, that's, that, that level of dishonesty is something that people see. And if it's okay for them, it's okay for us. And I've got news for you. We're the ones that's dying. It's not okay for us to live in this realm where we don't believe what's really real. We, as a people, um, in particular, Black people need to learn how to tell what is real and not just gravitate toward the, the, the conspiracy theory, you know, like there has to be a bridging of trust between medicine and, and our communities that, um, that I hope to, to begin to do, you know, through all of this work and through all of, all of this. I, I hope that Black people start believing at least Black doctors because okay, we, well we have to. Let's, let's, okay, please don't have me go there, Dr. Gary, <laughs> because that get my goal as well. Yeah. You know, if we, if we did want to talk about that, everyone, before I go into that so much, because if y'all follow me, many of you do know how I feel about you when it comes to our mental health and how we are still, even with the pandemic, mm -hmm. Dr. Gary, everyone, you know, I, I remember, first of all, let me back up before I really go there. This is Dr. Sarah Langley. <laughs> Let me get a little bit nicer. This is Dr. Monique Gary. And yes, we are here talking about how to overcome during and after the pandemic and having a candid conversation with Dr. Monique Gary, who is a breast surgeon, one of the top black female breast surgeons in the state of PA. And the fact that we are here talking about how to how in the world to help you, <laughs> how to help you out, how to make sure that you are well informed, how to make sure that you are getting the right information accordingly so that you can apply it towards your lifestyle, your livelihood, also with your mental capacity, knowing what to control versus what you cannot. You cannot control the government, you cannot control all the decisions that's going on, but you can control your responses, your reactions, and you getting that great and right accurate information so you can make some conscious decision on what is best for you and your family. And I love what you just said there. What had what really pushed me, my button, Dr. Gary, is the fact that, like you said, if black folks could trust black doctors, if black folks could just trust us, period. Mm -hmm. because of the fact that when it comes to mental health, part of the reason what had me to do this whole May is Mental Health Month series, I said, oh, I have to jump in on this because mental health in and of itself is a stigma. Yeah. It's still associated with a stigma. We still now decide to still go to the church and you know confess our sins and think that depression is a sin or it is you know something that is a generational curse, but not thinking about it as a medical or chemical imbalance, that it really is an actual illness and things like that. Mm -hmm. And what was what really caught my attention was the fact that in offering mental health services, free webinars and, and other products and services and offerings, thinking that the pandemic really, really got us because I read comments. I don't know about you, Dr. Gary. I'm the type of person that I would see someone that would post and it'd be like a hundred people who responded. I read every single thread, <laughs> every single one, because I'm trying to now get themes, trying to find the theme, the common theme, what is the problem, you know, what, who gave the right information, tips and tools, so that I can come in and provide the appropriate information because I had taken the time to diagnose. I took the time to uh, decide what was the problem that everyone is saying. And in doing all that, I said, okay, you know what, let me create a couple of webinars, products, checklists, things that could be easily accessible to our community in particular. And thinking because of the pandemic, with the way that people were responding, you know, that they're at, that, oh my gosh, they're suicidal, that they are so depressed and they're down and out. And still people 
weren't responding to the information that was provided. And so I usually am neutral on social media, but I decided to let it all out. I said, you know, I'm mad at y'all. I'm fussing at y'all right now. <laughs> I saw that. I, I, I saw that. But, you know, look what you did, though. You, you, you activated that energy and you, you took it into something that's so positive. And I applaud you for that because I remember seeing those posts and looking and wondering, you know, what are folks thinking? This is a therapist who's offering free services and, you know, wanting to, to help folks and, and, you know, crickets. But we all want to get on the interwebs and complain about things and, you know, post our displeasure with things. But, you know, you you led by example there. So I applaud you. I thank you for that. And, and, you know, I decided to push the button because a lot of times we do have to disrupt the pattern. We have to disrupt the the cycle that people are still, the narrative that they are still buying into because of our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents. That this is something that we just do not talk about. We, even with us being African American doctors, it, it's like you would think that that would open up the door of a conversation to seek help, whether through a medical doctor, through a psychologist, through a psychotherapist, and still not. And when I put it out there, I'm glad I did because now I was able to receive the responses. And it came down to the fact of those things: the fact that it's still a stigma because of the fact, even even with the fact that how the pandemic has totally decimated most of us and 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 did not know what to do and we we're at our, our at our breaking point at our wits end that we we're ready to commit suicide and everything but yet because of that being ingrained about it being a stigma i'm not crazy i don't put my business out there i just cannot do it so really it has to go to getting to that core root of what is really bonding us because it's such a conviction there yeah. that it's very challenging to change that conviction that people have that's ingrained unless they decide unless they decide that they want to change the narrative it comes down to a decision yeah and I, I think that that we have to recognize that you know the tools that we have and and the problems that we face are not single issue audrey lord always you know she said this that you know we don't face we don't live single issue lives you know, our, our issues are, are multifactorial. They are not single issue. And so if we suffer depression, if we suffer, um, you know, poor health, if we suffer anything, that the, the, the reasons why are not just because of one thing or another, um, but also in that the treatments, um, they are not, um, uh, I, I want to say, mutually exclusive. And so we lock ourselves into this thought that, okay, if depression is a spirit, which, you know, it certainly can be spiritual warfare, that the only way to deal with it is through uh, spiritual practices, which are now in- interrupted for some people during this pandemic, where, whereby you could, be, you know, take another approach that says, I'm going to use every resource available because if this is spiritual, it's, it's, um, it's going to require as much as, uh, of, of my resources as I have. So I'm going to see a therapist. I'm going to talk to my pastor. I'm going to pray. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to, you know, whatever the things are. And we limit ourselves in the same way that sometimes we limit ourselves about our health. I see people trying to use the maintenance for the cure. You know, we talk about cancer specifically, you know, God sent you cancer physicians, God sent certain surgeries and certain medicines. And while yes, there are toxicities and every drug is a poison, the ways that we can maintain health in our body are not necessarily sufficient enough to eliminate disease once it's gotten so progressed that a tumor has formed. And so we have to use everything. We can use medicine, we can use surgery, we can use our herbs, we can use our vegetables, we can learn that food is medicine, we can, we can do it all. And it doesn't have to operate in a silo and it, and it really shouldn't. That all these things, you know, as we say biblically, all things work together, right? And so I, I view a lot of what you're doing and the way you're trying to get people's minds to open as an extension of this, all things work together. Like that's really kind of where I think that people especially um, people who are raised in a Christian faith kind of have to get to. Um, and, and so it, it, it takes some work to get there and to be open to it. But, to, you know, when we find leaders who advocate for that and uh, community leaders and spiritual leaders, et cetera, you know, who are more and more, I think, um, reminding that their, their, their people and their flock and their communities that, you know, it, it takes more and we have more, we can be more, but we need to tap into those resources. I always say growing up, there's a couple of things that, you know, we didn't like to talk about as a people and it was always health and money. 
because we never had enough of either. You know, we might not have had enough insurance coverage. You might not have been able to take off work because you're the primary caretaker. And somewhere down the line, it became a badge of honor for some of us to be the everything and the caretaker and to be the superwoman. And, you know, as Black women, we know more than anybody. We got to look at ourselves really candidly and put our own masks on, literally and figuratively, put our own face masks on first, right? right. And take that, take that badge of, of hard work, take that badge of honor off. Work smarter, figure out how we can use everything we know and every resource to, to get ahead. You know, like we don't have to be the workhorse for everything and everybody. Um, and, and, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot of lessons uh, I think that you, you're going to have to work through to start getting folks to recognize how valuable good mental health is because the mind, the body, and the spirit are connected. You know, I tell a cancer patient, I do you no service to remove this tumor. If your mind isn't right and your spirit's not right, you know, the, the reasons why cancer uh, happens, you know, are, are physical, but also contributory to things like stress. You right. know, the effects of stress, and we should talk about that, the, the effects of this type of PTSD of what we're seeing right now on our bodies, yes. you know, yes. is, is, is real. It's really real, and it too is a determinant for things like hypertension. When you look at generational stress, when you look at the traumatic stress of watching events like this young black man getting shot in the street, you know, and running while he's out jogging, it, it manifests in our bodies as disease. And we keep playing it over and over and over again. And we've got to stop doing that because guess who is affecting us? Absolutely. Yeah, our rate of strokes, our rate of hypertension, our rate of cancer. And that's why I thank you for that. As a matter of fact, I was say I was going to say, you know, we need to pass the collection plate. I'm about to say, what's your cash app, Doc? <laughs> you got a little pre you know, pre preacher in you a little bit. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you follow me on social media. It's payment enough. I can't. I, I, I wouldn't. I couldn't. Um, you know. Um, but, but you know, and it's just it's good to have a, a way to talk to folks and reach them. I thank you for the platform to do it. You know, that's payment enough. If people say, you know what, there's a lot of free resources right now. Let me see. Let me just talk to a therapist. I don't have to pay for it, right? I don't have to pay for it right now. Let me just see what it's about. Like now is a safe time to do it because we're all dealing with anxiety, with depression, with isolation, with lack of resources. Many of us are dealing with unemployment, you know, with our family members. We can't grieve properly. Right. I can't tell you the number of patients that I've seen whose, you know, family members have died and we're the last ones holding the cell phones and doing FaceTime, you know, and, and it takes its toll on physicians too. And we need to, as a medical community, um, we got some work to do to remove the stigmas for healthcare providers getting mental health as well, because there are some stigmas and there are also some barriers. You know, there, there's a fear of retribution. Uh, if folks were to find out that, you know, your doctor had a therapist or was taking right. a medicine for depression and all those sorts right. of things, when, you know, we, people are people, you know, and those resources that we're telling everybody else to use, we need to be using as well, because we are the ones that are, you know, zipping up clothes and body bags and, you know, pronouncing people and seeing what's happening here and, you know, watching every day, these things take its toll on, on patients. And so it's, it's really, um, it, it needs to be said within the medical community as well. So I, I applaud you for reaching out specifically to us, um, as I've noticed that you've done. I thank you so much for that, Dr. Gary. And, and, I just really wanted to say, I, I thank you as well for even, again, making yourself available so that we can now rally together and partner up in this fashion to set the example mm -hmm. and to let people know that, look, we are here, we are available, we do care about our community, we do care about our people, but now we've done, we're doing our part, we put it out there. Now it is presented for people to grab onto, you know, and to decide for themselves what is best for them and getting this type of information to help them with making better choices, conscious decisions about their lifestyle, their livelihood and beyond. And, and I want to kind of pause there to just say, um, to, to recap on what you said, and then I just, I just would love to ask you, we have to have a part two. We have to have a part two. Really? Um, we have to talk about the stress. We have to talk about, um, I'm so glad that you said this in terms of the, the healthcare professionals, because while I do counsel some, the rest, I am also trying to get them on board because of that very thing that you said. I, look, I understand because I know when I have to renew my license and it asks me, have I had a therapist? <laughs> have I ever been depressed? And I have to, you know, kind of like decide, do I want to answer this accurately? <laughs> so yes, that is real talk. Yeah. But nonetheless, like you said, people are people. At the end of the day, when we take the hat off, the role, it's not us. We are people 
who are still in need of whatever is necessary for us to be holistically healthy, holistically whole, mind, body, and spirit. Yeah. And ourselves, I, I really want to drive this home. And then I'm just going to ask you um, and everyone, please, if you have any questions, please put it in the comment section. I'm able to see it on my phone. So please let me know if you have any questions for Dr. Gary um, before we actually wrap up. Um, I want to drive home what you said on this, Dr. Gary. The fact that in making these conscious decisions and using the resources that are made available to us and, and being able to partner together to set that example for people to follow, <laughs> it's interesting how we are at this place right now where almost like, and I don't want to say this in a negative way, but it, it's like things were just stripped. It's like it, it puts us in a position to now really face ourselves, okay. to face the situation, and to now really come to get to know who we are. Like we have been, from a psychological standpoint, people have been so distracted with the hustle and bustle, the busy life, um, with family, with home life, with social life, with personal life. It's like all these different things that really prevented us, whether conveniently <laughs> um, or, or subconsciously created that narrative where now people do not know how to handle or manage being at home. I have, I'm counseling couples who you would think people were making fun on, on, on social media with the memes about, you know, the, the quarantines, mm -hmm. you know, going to have all these babies that's going to pop out in, in March of next year and things like that. But in all honesty, from what I gather, there's a lot of people who are like, look, I'm thinking about divorce because I really do not know this person. <laughs> The voice rates in Japan skyrocketed. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, yes. Sure. 25% up, you know, because of that. And, and so now having a lot of couples reaching out for that very reason, it's, it's interesting how it really had us to face ourselves. And I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm asking you in terms of, um, again, we have to bring you back on. So I hope that we can coordinate accordingly so we can really continue to have this conversation. Sure. I, I wonder what tips and advice or or suggestions or anything that you may have that's on your heart for us to take home in regards to bringing a close this, this conversation what what would you suggest that we should do you know and during this time and preparing for the mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. um you know i i think there's so many things you could pick but let's start with what i think is probably the most important thing which is um, for people who may be watching now or, or even watching the replay who are thinking, yeah, 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 I get it, I get it, I, I see what you're saying, but how do I get there? How do I make that, as, as, as my friend Dr. Javon Adams says, that pivot? You know, that's a huge word right now. And, yeah. and I think the, the, the pivot from this feeling of frustration or powerlessness or depression or anxiety or whatever it is, is to begin to look at things differently. My, my favorite quote is, is by Dr. Wayne Dyer. He says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Yes. And so for every situation that you're in or every thought that you're able to sort of grab onto, because thoughts are fleeting and we're not always aware of the thoughts that we're thinking that fuel how our day goes. But when we take a few minutes and, and spend in quiet and think about our thoughts and analyze those thoughts or analyze those feelings, you know, for, so, for some of us, like I have anxiety. And so it's like the motor is always sort of running. And if I stop and say, you know, I feel extra anxious and my stomach's in knots. And I stop and I look at what's causing me to feel that way then my next question is, well, how could I view this differently? Hmm. You know, what can I change about what I'm thinking? Where's the blessing in this? What can I give thanks for? What can I do that shifts the energy from something is happening to me to I'm observing what's happening, but I'm taking control over how I'm responding to it. Yes. And so there's that moment where as many times a day as you need to, as many times a day as you can, you've got to shift your thoughts about it, every, every calamity, every pandemic, every, you know, every tragedy, there's an opportunity. And if you can get to that point of saying, okay, what's the inverse of this? If there's a 20% chance I'm going to get something, there's an 80% chance I'm not. If I'm feeling anxious right now about these things, I can't control these things, but I can control this. Or I, this is a great time for me to start the business of whatever. This is a good time for my children are home and they're not doing their math right now. Let me show them how to, how to manage a checkbook, how to balance a checkbook. Let's do some recipes and do some math that I know. You know, like either where is the moment of power? 
Yes. So for everybody who's watching, I think you really have to start there. For every situation you feel powerless in, what can I control? And yes. then move affirmatively in that direction. And it will take you from wherever you are to someplace else. You might not get all the way, but you will pivot from that, that, that degree of despair, that degree of depression, because your focus will have shifted. And so we all have to make that shift many, many times a day, as many times as you can, because that's what changes the narrative that controls your day. Amen to that. That is amazing what you just said. That's yeah. <laughs> amazing, amazing, because it's just amening and confirming what we have been talking about this whole entire time since we started this mental May is Mental Health Month um, series, webinar series, in regards to knowing to control what you can control, not paying attention or focusing your energy on what you cannot control. Mm -hmm. And the fact that making that decision, that choice to decide on what you're going to do, how you're going to take hold of your life, your lifestyle, your livelihood. And you do that by creating choice because right now we're defaulting to what we know, the yeah. narrative, what we know. So we're going to keep going there because there is no, nothing else that's created to now give you an option. And this is exactly why, as Dr. Gary has said, the fact that we are here providing you with the offer, the, the, the free information, the resources that you have to now pick and choose accordingly for yourself and for your lifestyle, as opposed to just the faulty to just what you know, what is familiar because it's comfortable, because you don't know anything else. Use this time now to shift the narrative, to shift the, the, your energy, to shift your mindset and perspective so that now you will be at a better position and take the advantage to be able to now create a new narrative for yourself to, as, as we have been talking in this series about being able to create, not just find calm and chaos, but to create your own calm in this chaos so that you will be better prepared for after the pandemic. Because again, what we've known before is no more. And this is exactly why many of us, if not the world, have been feeling something called grief and loss. We have been grieving globally. We have, and we're also are entering into global PTSD. So it is high time for us to now be prepared. And I'm talking not just to everyone, to the collective audience here, but those who are in healthcare, those who are the frontliners as well. We're also talking to you too, <laughs> so that you can now make a decision on what's going to be best because whatever you're going through right now, maybe nothing compared to, you know, um, compared to the after. So let's start getting prepared now while we are able to get prepared now so that collectively we can now not just create a better world for ourselves, but also create a better world within here. I love that. It creates some better health, better physical health. It creates some better narratives and some better uh, networks so that we can provide information and not just spread misinformation you know, so that we can have some trusted resources coming out of this and um, really start to take control of our health our story, you know, I, I, I cannot continue to watch us be the face of death and the face of, uh, of, of everything that is um, pain and suffering, you know, without, without accepting the opportunity to be at the forefront of prevention. Like yes. that's what we got to get to for us. Yes, yes. And I think by us now partnering together in this kind of conversation, it's really that step toward that very thing and getting us to a place of prevention, but even being proactive mm -hmm. to not wait until someone had, had uh, said this so well, one of my colleagues, she said that instead of us waiting until, okay, we put our mask on, like they say on the airlines, we put our mask on before we put on anyone else's. But it seems like subconsciously, we also associating it only when we put the mask on is when it's an emergency, as opposed to now making sure that we already have it on period, right. way before so that we are now holistically healthy and whole and complete. Mm -hmm. And so we are changing and shifting this narrative. So there's no more waiting until, okay, we have to be, we're, we're strong black women because we were able to take on everything. But at the same time, how much of a detriment it can be to take on that narrative of saying that we're strong. And that, that means that subconsciously we're telling ourselves that we gotta always be strong and that we cannot be weak. We cannot be vulnerable. We don't, we can't trust anything. We don't want anyone to hurt us. It, you have to now just know whatever you're saying to yourself, how is it really being communicated subconsciously? And then when you see that, you make a decision, you create an option and a choice so that now you get a healthy balance that's going to take care of you holistically whole and complete mind, body, and spirit. So, so mm -hmm. much to unpack. And I'm just happy that we have started to unpack it. Yes. So Dr. Gary, thank you so much for your time. It's really a pleasure talking with you. And we're definitely going to be in conversation about a part two. And everyone, 
Um, please y'all make sure that you catch the replay. If you have any questions, you can always put in the comment section as well so we can continue to have the conversation and let us know if there's anything else that you want us to address so that we can address it accordingly. This is your community and this is your platform as well. We welcome you in it so that at the end of the day, you will know how to overcome during and after this pandemic. So Dr. Absolutely. Gary, thank you. thank you for having me. Folks can follow me on social media at Dr. Monique Gary on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the things. Uh, did I say um, Facebook? Facebook, wow. <laughs> uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, all, YouTube. I got a YouTube channel now too. But thank you for holding space for us. And thank you for, for taking up the banner, having this great conversation. It has been my pleasure. And I look forward to doing it again soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'll make sure that y'all turn tune into her Wednesday. Is it every Wednesday at 6 p.m. on blackdoctor.org. Uh, black Awesome. Awesome. All right. And thank you so much, Dr. Gary. Thank you, everyone. Everyone have a great day. We'll talk to you again soon.